Oops. Okay, I'm going to talk about the history of uh, gun laws in Colorado and also where we're headed in the future. And I always like to start out with this um, picture of, I'm sure everyone knows this place in Colorado, the most uh, picture scenic site of the uh, Maroon Bells. And I, and I put it up because we have a state that is just absolutely, I think inarguably the most beautiful state in the union. And uh, where, but we uh, have some very ugly things that have happened in our in our um, in Colorado. So, with regard to gun laws in the 20th century, uh, Colorado law was not much on guns was not much more than federal law, with two exceptions. We allowed open open carry across the state, and that's just by default. It's not anywhere in the statute prohibiting it. And then we enacted in the 1980s a stand your ground law that allows you to um, shoot someone or kill someone or harm someone in your home and not be called into questions by the court, either in a civil or criminal process. Um, interestingly, our constitution has a strong gun rights plank, but it specifically exempts concealed carry from that. So when we think about gun laws in this state, what it, it, it's, what really is the strongest determinant of whether what we enact and pass is the partisan makeup of the governor's office and the legislature. And this chart shows going way back into the 50s, the makeup of the governor's office and, um, and the Senate and House uh, at the legislature. And you can see that what we had from the like 1970s on, and actually even before that, 1960s and on, is a, is a legislature totally dominated by the Republicans. And back here in the 70s, we had moderate Republican um, governors and then a long period of Democratic governors that kept things in check on a lot of issues including guns. And that all changed with the 1998 election when Bill Owens was elected governor and the Senate and House stayed in Republican hands. And so the gun organizations, the NRA and others were like just um, quite anxious and ready to come into Colorado and change our gun laws uh, quickly in uh, 1999. But what came in the way is that on April 20th at Columbine High School, 12 students were shot and killed as well as one of their instructors, one of their teachers. There were also a number of people injured and some with, when I say lifetime injury, it's um, paralyzing their in wheelchairs um, for the rest of their lives. The legislature immediately um, either killed or the governor vetoed all the pro-gun rights bills that were going through the um, General Assembly. And, um, and at that time, Governor Owens and Attorney General Ken Salazar came out with proposals for the next year's legislature, the 2000 legislature. And they did put a moratorium on pro-gun rights bills in the 2000 legislature with a couple of exceptions. There was some of the thing about guns and cars, particularly aimed at Denver and an immunity bill that expanded immunity um, issues on for the firearms industry. And I picture Castle Rock here because in June of 1999, only a month and a half after the Columbine massacre, there were three little girls killed in Castle Rock by their father, who was under a protection order and was a prohibited gun buyer because of that. But the legislature in its lacking in wisdom, I would say, in that year had taken the background checks away from, the, from CBI and moved them over to FBI. So his protection order was, orders were not found. 
and so he uh, actually purchased guns while from a gun dealer while his children played in the front yard, his three daughters, and then he went and shot and killed them in front of the Castle Rock police station. Because of that, the 2000 legislature returned the background checks to the CBI. And there are several other things they did was make it a felony for straw purchases. And they did a couple of bills on juvenile firearms issues, such as you can't provide a handgun to a minor. What they didn't pass, which were on the uh, plans for Bill Owens, the Republican governor, and Ken Salazar, the Democratic AG, is a safe storage law and also making handguns uh, that you have to be 21 years of age to purchase a handgun. But the biggest one that people were upset about is they killed the bill to close the gun show loophole. Why is that? Because three of the four guns used in the Columbine shooting originated at or were purchased at a gun show. In the 2000 election thereafter, um, Safe Colorado, a group that doesn't exist anymore, but they uh, were a large statewide group working on gun violence prevention. And they put forward a voter initiative, a huge, huge uh, work to do to close the gun show loophole. It was totally volunteer led in terms of collecting signatures and the, and the loophole, uh, closing the loophole passed by 70% to 30%, a 40% difference. And it even passed in, in very conservative counties like El Paso. Um, it was also the year that we at Colorado Ceasefire began, and we began as a PAC, a political action committee. And we worked with other groups to uh, make changes and remove those legislators who stood in the way of um, passing reasonable gun laws. And the gun issue was quite pivotal in the 2000 election. And there, were a ch there was a changeover in six seats. One of the results is that the Democrats took the second Senate for the first time in 40 years. And so I'm going to show now a change over in, in what the legislature has looked like. And I put a black line in here for that 2000, right after the 2000 election, showing how things have really changed in this state in terms of the political dominance at both the, um, at, at, at the legislature and even in the governorship is still um, largely, except for the eight years of Bill Owens has been uh, maintained by the Democrats. And I, and I emphasize this because this, this, these dealing with gun violence prevention is a, tends to be break along partisan lines. It's, we've had very, very few Republicans ever vote with us on bills we, we wish. Um, anyways. So in the years 2002 to 2012, um, there really weren't many things happening because we had this checkerboard of um, at one uh, party have not having dominance. It's like things are going to pass one way or the other in gun violence issues if there's total Senate, House governorship in the possession of one party. But we did in 2002 get a law that Bill Owens signed that makes the mental health records um, gets get passed on to the FBI. And I don't know how those things are happening. Um, the worst year uh, was 2003, when we had uh, concealed carry was enacted. Um, there are now 300,000 permits in the state. At that time, they estimated there would be 60,000. I will note, and it kind of leads into understanding of things that happen later, that the yes votes for that concealed carry law included 16 Democrats. So it's, in that case, we did have Democrats voting in for pro-gun um, issues. And a preemption uh, that is, it was also enacted, which prohibited cities and counties from passing stronger laws than gun laws than the state or the federal laws. From there on, it was pretty much a, um, a stalemate, not really much passed because we had either um, 
one house was one of the issues was controlled by one of the other parties or uh, we had a lot of pro-gun rights Democrats still in the um, legislature. And that all changed with the Aurora Theater shooting on July 20th of 2012, where 12 uh, people were shot and killed, another 70 were wounded. We are, and I say ceasefire, our lobbyist at the time, Anne-Marie Jensen, convened a set of stakeholders and we worked for uh, uh, up through December, we worked, had monthly meetings to discuss what could we do to address the gun violence in the state. In particular, the people in that, the groups represented in that stakeholders group were gun violence prevention advocates, domestic violence prevention advocates, mental health advocates, and uh, sheriffs and police and some legislative um, representatives. We actually met every month and our last meeting was December 14th, which on that morning, 21st graders and six educators were killed at Sandy Hook in Connecticut. When we, I can remember driving to the meeting, crying all the way, knowing because I had just learned about, about that awful, horrific shooting. And we received at that point uh, a message from the leadership of the House and Senate that we, they were going to proceed forward on the slate of bills that we were proposing. Prior to the Sandy Hook, we were getting some resistance on some of the bills. So that was a, uh, the Sandy Hook was a uh, quite impactful in terms of uh, policy changes in the state of Colorado. So what did get enacted in 2013? We didn't get everything we wanted. I think there were eight bills that came forward, but five of them became law. But what Colorado got was a universal background check. So that is that there is a background check in before every gun transfer and that the buyers will pay for the background check, not the taxpayers. We put a ban on, on high capacity ammunition magazines over 15 rounds and that domestic violence abusers must relinquish their guns uh, upon a uh, permanent protection order or a conviction for domestic violence. And another one is that it's unacceptable to use an online class to get a concealed carry permit. On the signing of the bills, John Moore said, the number of gun owners who will lose their firearms because of these laws is zero. But the gun rights people were not listening to that. They didn't really believe it. And so there was quite a backlash. The sheriff sued and lost in court, in federal court, and actually the Rocky Mountain gun owners sued and lost in state court. 31 sheriffs refused to enforce the laws. And I, there was what I call recall madness. And that John Morse, who was the Senate president, and Angela Heron from Pueblo, a senator from Pueblo, both lost their seats in recall elections. And Evie Hudak from out in Arvada in Westminster uh, resigned hers rather than go into a, a recall election. And I call it the tyranny of the minority because the, all of those, those two elections in Pueblo and Colorado Springs were very low turnout and they didn't, they couldn't use mail-in ballots. And it was um, actually pretty sad um, what the turnout is. And when turnout, voter turnout is low, it allows the people who have very, very strong feelings about something to, to hold sway. So after 2018, the Senate uh, went to the other party and as that, that was through two, 2014 to 2018 and we had again a stalemate. A stalemate. What we largely were doing at the Capitol was doing defensive and protecting the laws we had. The advocates tried and failed to repeal the high capacity magazine ban. They've done that pretty much every year since 2013. Uh, they've tried and given up on trying to repeal the background checks and the fees. Every year since then, they've 
endeavor to arm teachers. And actually it's even more than arming teachers. The, the, the bill they're proposing now is that anyone with a concealed carry permit can walk into a, um, a public school carrying a gun if it's hidden, a hidden handgun. And we have defeated that for like, what is it, two, 11 years or something like that, um, 10 years. Uh, enact a stand your ground in a business location to expand the stand your ground we have into uh, business locations and also uh, enact a permitless concealed carry law. In 2016, uh, May of 2016, after the legislature adjourned, we held a forum at CU Anschutz with um, law enforcement, legislators, and um, behavioral health uh, medical providers or social workers to talk about the extreme risk protection order idea. It was it came, it somewhat arose from a failed bill that we tried to do in 2013. We were hoping, we were having this forum, hoping to generate interest in it for um, hoping to get the legislature back so that we could run the bill, but the election didn't go that way. So we realized we were gonna to have to wait till another couple of years. But what happened is that on December 31st of 2017, out in Highlands Ranch, there was an ambush of law enforcement by a mentally disturbed young man whose mother had actually tried to take his guns away from him. Uh, four law enforcement personnel were wounded and Zachary Parrish III was shot and killed. It was a classic situation that an ERPO or extremist protection order or red flag law could have prevented. So we actually, our lobbyist Anne McGee and now we um, switched, Anne Marie Jensen had retired and, um, and Anne, Anne McGeehan went and worked very hard to try to get a bill introduced in 2018 to, um, to address, to do the ERPO. And we did eventually get it introduced towards the very end of the session. And it died as probably everybody would have predicted in the Senate committee um, by a party line vote. But what happened is it became a discussion for the elections and thing, and the whole legislative makeup changed after the 2018 election. And so in the 2019 session, the ERPA was one of the major bills people knew that was coming and was enacted. The sponsor was Tom Sullivan, whose son was Alex, was killed at the um, Aurora Theater. So he took this on diligently. What the law does is it allows law enforcement or families to go to go to court to seek a court order to suspend firearms access from someone dangerous to self or others. There are 19 other states that have this in DC. And I just will put it in a plug as an aside. We have a talk about the extreme risk that we would love to come out and share with any of your groups across the state or any community groups you're with because the law has more power the more people know about it. 80% of the voters supported ERPO, but it still passed largely on party lines. There were a couple of Democrats, a few Democrats who voted against it, but no Republicans voting for it. And in fact, the Rocky Mountain gun owners and others worked to try to recall Tom Sullivan and the governor and several other legislators because of this bill. And all of those um, recall efforts fizzled. And actually, I think they were quite embarrassed by how poorly they did. Um, in the next two years following the implementation of the law, there were 255 petitions filed across the state. Two thirds of them were granted. The court hearing is within one day after one court day after you apply. Interestingly, there were um, half the counties in the state had applied, had passed resolutions to make it to make themselves what they called Second Amendment sanctuary counties. But in those counties, uh, slightly more than half of those sanctuary counties have now had ERPOs filed in them. 
So let's skip down to 2021 and just talk about some of the shaping events of things that happened in Colorado to affect our effect, effect um, stronger gun laws. And you might remember when there was the Columbine Remembrance, a 20 year remembrance in 2019, there was a young woman from Florida who came up and was in per, presumably endeavoring to have a Columbine um, reenactment of some sort. And um, because of the knowledge of her around and being armed, the schools all up and down the front range shut down for a day or two and students, 500,000 students didn't go to school because of this young woman. Only a couple months later, there was the STEM school shooting or maybe a month later, the STEM school shooting out in Highlands Ranch where Kendall Castillo was killed. And most gripping for the state was the massacre at the Boulder King Supers where 10 people were shot and killed, including a responding law officer. That happened in March of 2021. Prior to the Boulder shooting, we had three bills underway that we had actually been trying to do in 2020 also, but because COVID nothing happened. Um, we, 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 and we did enact a domestic violence relinquishment law that expands or strengthens the law that was um, passed in 2013 and a safe storage law that requires uh, that people, if you are a gun owner, that you safely lock up your firearm so that it is not accessible by a juvenile or a prohibited person. And um, we have brochures on that too that we could uh, provide to you if you would wish. And then the other is that if, you, if you're a gun owner and you um, lose or have a gun stolen that you need to report it uh, as soon as possible. And there's, I think it's three days or I can't remember right now. Um, anyways, post the Boulder massacre, a number of gun laws were introduced and, and, be, and became law. Uh, one was to expand the background checks so that violent misdemeanor, uh, if you have a violent misdemeanor, you are prohibited for five years from purchasing a firearm. The reason that one was in there is that the Boulder shooter did have an assault uh, conviction. And they also closed the Charleston loophole. Charleston loophole is, it, well, how we closed it in Colorado is that in order to buy a gun or receive a gun transfer, you have to pass a background check. You have to pass a background check. There's no three day provision for the FBI or CBI to look and find uh, whether you have, you know, that if they can't figure out whether you're um, a prohibited buyer or not, that you can get the weapon in three days. That's not true in Colorado. It's infinite now. You have to pass the background check. We also repealed preemption that had been passed in 2003. This was a related to the Boulder shooting because Boulder had enacted an assault weapons ban and 10 days before the Boulder massacre, a judge had overturned it on preemption grounds. And then we also established the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, which is charged with um, awareness programs of our, of our Colorado laws and a data resource bank and also distributing funds for violent uh, violence intervention as they become available. This last year, what did we pass? We passed a vote without fear so that this was relevant to legal women voters so that when people go to vote, they don't have to worry about uh, people intimidating them with firearms. Uh, you cannot have uh, open carry a hundred feet from a voting site. And, and if you say, well, why would they ever, people ever do that? Well, they did. In Littleton, there was uh, cases of where people did that. Um, we also uh, passed a bill to, um, and this became law, to return to what's called POWPO, possession of a weapon by a previous offender, to return 61 felonies to that list uh, that that a bill the previous year mistakenly uh, we did too broad a brush and 
Um, I, there was a George Brockler op-ed pointed it out and it was sort of, it was something that slipped through then we went, oh my gosh. So we got that back in, I uh, got 61. We didn't get all of them. We wanted every felony or we wanted more than the 61, but you know, they said when you go to the CCJJ, which is the Colorado Commission on Juvenile Justice, uh, you get what you, you get, you're gonna negotiate. So I wanted to talk about uh, just what's happening in communities or in the, particularly in the Denver metro area using the preemption repeal. Here in Denver, back in like January, they did a ghost guns ban, ghost guns being those that don't have serial numbers. Um, and then also this April, May, they passed an ordinance that you cannot take guns onto city owned properties. And that includes parks, museums, zoos, botanic gardens, whatever the city owns. Uh, also a number of Boulder cities and the county have enacted a number of things, assault weapons ban, a high capacity magazine ban for 10 rounds where the state is 15, uh, trigger activators and stabilizing devices bans, bans on open carry and sensitive places such as bars, uh, churches, although churches can exempt themselves and a, num a, a lengthy list, medical um, providers, uh, daycare centers, things like that. Uh, requiring signs and stores about gun violence, a waiting period, ghost gun ban, and minimum age. And then the small city of Edgewater, just to the west of Denver, enacted an open carry ban. Before I go further and talk about future things, um, I just wanted to run down what the status is on our gun violence epidemic nationally. 45,000 people were shot and killed in 2020. This is um, high, at the all time high for the number of gun violence victims. Two, th two thirds of them were suicides. In Colorado, likewise, it's a high um, number for the state. There were in 2021, 1,059 gun deaths. 70% of them were suicides. We are a high suicide state. 75% of the homicides were by gun. I can remember being at the state capitol and one state senator saying, and she said this a number of times, oh, I don't know why there's all this emphasis on guns because most homicides are done by bats or cars or rocks or knives, not by guns. And I just, I kind of was sitting there going, at that time it was in the 60%. I go, how can you get most out of 100 minus 60. Anyway, so I didn't understand her. And it's now up to 75% of homicides in the state of Colorado are by firearm. So the Bruin decision on June 23rd, the, um, the, the Supreme Court of the United States came out with its Bruin decision. We had a lot of fears for this. And when I first heard it, I thought, oh, it's not so bad. But then I didn't, I had to learn more about it. As Beth mentioned, the suit itself was regarding a, um, the, the, the New York State concealed carry law that required that you had to have a reason. You had to demonstrate a need for having a concealed carry permit. But Justices of the Supreme Court, some of them were very anxious to make further incursions on, on gun laws. And Thomas's opinion altered the, what the most serious thing it did is that it altered the evaluative process for evaluating whether a law is constitutional or not. Since the Heller decision, it's been a two-part process or evaluation. First is on the history, text, and tradition. And the second was whether the law was of community interest, whether it was important for the public safety of the um, community. And the Supreme Court and the Justice Thomas opinion totally removed the second uh, evaluation. And I want to read something that Kelly Roscom, who's at the um, Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions said, 
This means courts evaluating future challenges to gun safety laws will increasingly rely on incomplete, false, or extremely subjective readings of history rather than empirical evidence about the real world impact of expanding access to guns and leading to more gun deaths. So here in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain gun owners, which I want to comment has been has been losing a lot of its power over the last number of years because they keep losing elections like crazy. The, can the candidates they support, um, like this year in the primaries, I can't remember how many they, people they supported, but not a single one of them won in the primaries. Same thing in 2020. And uh, I think in 2018, they might have done similar. I'd have to go back and check. But they've been doing very poorly in what at one time they kind of ruled the roost in the primaries. So this has become their way, I think, of getting power back and they're suing. They sued Superior, Boulder City and County and Louisville. The actions of Superior, a, 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 a federal district court judge said to that Superior had to uh, put in a temporary restraining order on its assault weapons and high capacity magazine bans and another judge did the same thing for Boulder City. Um, the county and Louisville, a county has imposed its own. We're not, we're not going to impose it yet. We're just going to hold off, uh, waiting to see what happens with these cases. They have also sued the state of Colorado on the high capacity magazine ban. And let me tell you, every time they refer to it, they will say standard magazine. There is no such thing standard magazine. It's, it's the other thing that the gun industry does. They call assault weapons modern sporting rifles. And they call permitless concealed carry constitutional carry. And as I showed you earlier in the Colorado Constitution, it's, it's not even, it's totally specifically exempted. So there's things in language I want to have people listen there to and hear and not repeat. It is not constitutional carry. It is not standard magazine. And it, they are not modern sporting rifles. They are assault weapons that were designed for military use. So what's happening nationally on Bruin? There are cases. There are 14 states where uh, appeals or, or, or lawsuits have been filed to overturn state laws on or federal too on um, Bruin using Bruin. You know Colorado's there with five were exceeded by New York and California. There's also what's quite concerning to me is that public defenders in Maryland and New York City are invoking Bruin to get people off from gun charges and they have been successful in some cases that they say, well, you can't prohibit guns to a felon because of Bruin. So nationally, I just wanted to point out there've been two successful cases at the district level. Oh, actually, I think these were appellate level in Texas. Um, in Texas, handgun carry, uh, they had a law that you could not carry openly or concealed until you were age 21. They, a judge overturned that law on Bruin. And in Texas also uh, just came in two days ago on the 19th that a judge uh, put a ban, uh, overturned a ban on purchase by indicted felons. And that is, and it's in, for certain felonies. And that is um, a federal law that he overturned uh, for in the in the Texas court. It's a federal court. I put those in bold because these have been overturned, and they are they are things that we have here in Colorado. So they affect stuff here in Colorado if they are upheld by the Supreme Court. Of course, we're not in the Texas appellate district or Texas circuit, so they don't affect us right now but it is a concern for the future to, be, to watch these cases. Pending other, some of the cases, what they're, what they're challenging on, the assault weapons ban, high capacity magazine ban, like in Colorado, I put in red 
if we have either a state law or local ordinances that this would affect. Um, purchase age of 18 for semi-automatics, which is something we might be considering. Uh, open carry bans, which we have here in Denver and, and Boulder counties have done. This next one is just really frightening to me machine gun conversion devices. In 1934, because of gangland violence, they enacted a strong gun law and it's been holding there for what, 90 years almost, 85, 90 years. Um, this is where most people think machine guns are illegal. Actually, you have to get a special permit to get them, it includes silencers and a number of other things. Um, regarding um, weaponry. Uh, something that we don't have that is on our docket of what we would like to get is requiring a permit to purchase a firearm. Um, and also concealed carry requiring a permit is under um, uh, lawsuit now and firearms possession by drug felons. And in New York, New York passed a replacement law for concealed carry. And one of those are a bunch of sensitive places that they listed. We also have sensitive places we have listed here in Denver and in the Boulder counties of where you can't carry guns. So federally, I used to, when I talk in something like this, I'd say federal, don't hold your breath. It's paralyzed, nothing's gonna happen. Well, for the first time in nearly 30 years, a gun violence prevention bill moved and became enacted into law. And it happened the day it passed the Senate and House, the, or the House, I think, on the day after the Supreme Court uh, Bruin decision. And then on June 25th, the president signed it into law. It isn't an overwhelmingly strong law like most of us would be wanting but it does have some good stuff. It has money to encourage states to enact burpo laws and also would help uh, fund things in Colorado to uh, uh, insist in the implementation of the law. Closes the boyfriend loop, well that is dating, uh, dating uh, partners who are doing domestic violence uh, can be prohibited from buying guns. A big one is clarifying the definition of what is a, a firearm stealer or firearm seller, whether they have to be a registered dealer, and some money for mental health and school safety and violence intervention. So what's under the uh, plans of what we're talking about right now, and we're having conversations with legislators, and we had just uh, last Thursday, a big conversation at the Colorado Coalition Against Gun Violence, which Ceasefire is a member. Probably preeminent coming forward will be a ban on ghost guns. And you go, well, they already did that federally with uh, an executive order, but it doesn't cover existing guns. And so we want to cover existing guns that they have to be serialized. And then what we hope to do last year also and didn't happen was a lawsuit ban repeal, repealing that law of 2000 and also some things that were from back there from the 1980s. The gun industry has immunity protections that no other industry in this country has to such a broad level. Pharmaceuticals have some, but not to the broad level that the gun industry has. You cannot sue a manufacturer or a dealer um, under state law and also federal law. And you might know there was a Sandy Hook case that got through and they kind of weaseled their way through and found it. But Colorado's law is very, very punitive. And Sandy and Lonnie Phillips, whose daughter, Jessica Gowie, was killed in the Aurora Theater, sued Lucky Gunner that provide, provided thousands of rounds of ammunition. And they ended up being hit with a $200,000 uh, bill to pay Lucky Gunner for their attorney's fees. They never did pay it, they went bankrupt instead. So some other things that are being discussed is a minimum age for assault weapons. You'll notice that was on the list that's being sued. Um, a waiting period, gun dealer licensing, and also concealed carry permit standardization. The state law passed in 2003 says that in order to apply for a permit, you have to demonstrate competence with a handgun. 
And one of the ways you can do that is through taking a concealed carry class. Well, these classes, and we're, I just heard a candidate for office who took one saying it was a total joke. And I said, did you ever fire a weapon? And she said, no, we never went to the range. Well, how do you demonstrate competence with a firearm if you never show the instructor you can fire the gun? So um, we want to, um, we want to standardize it that there are certain things you have to meet if you have a real concealed carry class training class some other things that we want to look at they may not be for this coming year maybe further down but is putting in alcohol related measures with regard to gun violence people maybe who have accumulated a whole bunch of duis they can't buy guns or prohibiting guns in bars other things there's a strong correlation between alcohol and drug abuse and gun violence. And the, the best thing we could ever probably pass is gun owner licensing. It's a proven uh, effective means of reducing gun violence. And so just last thing I wanna say, well, do you think you might go, well, you know, all this federal stuff, do state gun laws make a difference? You know, cause you could go over to Wyoming or or Kansas to buy things that we're prohibiting in Colorado. And we're aware of that. We can't, we can't write their laws in Wyoming and Kansas, but actually they do make a difference. And I'll show by this chart, if we ranked the state by how strong their gun laws are. So number one, it would be strongest gun laws, which probably is Massachusetts up there is Hawaii and California. And then that's on the on the x axis and then on the y axis is the rank of the gun deaths so the number one ranking state would be like Louisiana Alaska Mississippi and 50 would be up here California Massachusetts the very low ones the low I shouldn't say California it's a little higher than it should be but Massachusetts Hawaii very low gun deaths. and what we have here is a negative trend showing that the stronger your gun laws are, the lower your gun death rate is. And for those of you who are in the statistics and mathematics, the correlation coefficient is negative 0.75, which is a strong correlation. So yes, even though people can go to Kansas and Wyoming, we still enacting stronger gun laws in our state reduces gun death. And the last thing I want to say, and this is no secret to you all, you're in the League of Women Voters. Um, you're a voter, let them know what you want. Know your legislators, let them know what you want to see. Um, be, keep informed, write to them, call them, speak, volunteer for the, for the um, candidates that support strong gun laws and contribute to their campaigns, and also contribute to groups such as ceasefire and others that are working to um, reduce gun violence. So are there any questions? If you have a question, you may either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Maud, please unmute yourself. Um, just, just, uh... <laughs> parroting what Sherry Martin um, from Estes Park said, which it, which was, could the PowerPoint be made available, please? Because um, she can't type fast enough, and oh, some sure. of us can't either. Yeah, sure. I know, and I, you know, I only had, and I probably overdid it a little bit too, um, but I did get kind of in the time she gave me. Um, yeah, we can. I can send it as uh, send that. I uh, send it to Beth. Okay. Great. Uh, and drink, Fantastic. And, um, and, and make it available to you. But you know, the thing is, is my power, the PowerPoint is a lot of talk, highlight points. I don't give all the talk of what I say in it, but it can remind you maybe of what was said. Great. And uh, yes, we'll else. send out, yeah. we'll also send out a recording, a link to the recording of this okay. as well. Okay. Uh, Mary. Yes, first of all, thank you, Eileen. That was an excellent summary of everything. The one thing that confuses me is the Colorado levels gun licensing or gun dealer licensing. What, what would that effect be? Yeah, and you know, Mary, I'm the biggest champion of this anywhere. And a, <laughs> and a lot of it came to mind 
when we went to protest at the Centennial Gun Dealers down in Centennial, Colorado, and that Centennial Gun, uh, whatever it is, rain, shop, store, it's selling high capacity magazines. I observed the sale of one of those magazines um, and, and I will share that the, the, the clerk said to the customer, well, you know, I'm going to have to disassemble this um, because it's a 25 round magazine, I'm gonna to have to take it apart. And so he took the magazine apart and put all the parts back in, in, in the um, envelope that it was uh, is for sale in or the package and then and then showed the buyer how to reassemble the magazine. Um, I was quite outraged by this and actually we held a protest there. And when I came home that day, I stopped at a 7-Eleven and there was a sign over the clerk that said, we're not selling any tobacco products right now, sorry. And I, so I asked him, so why aren't you selling tobacco, being ignorant? And he goes, because we were part of a sting. And I went, oh, yes. If we made, the, so that's just one part of it. If we made gun dealer licensing, we could make those dealers follow Colorado law. That they have to obey the law out in out in the centennial when the arapaho county sheriff was choosing not to enforce it he was aware they were doing it we had a protest when we had that protest we informed the sheriff's office that we were going to be out there and they said well you have to pay us if you want protection and we said we're not asking for you to protect us we just want you to know in case they call you that you know these troublemakers are outside that you know what's going on well, they sent three deputy sheriffs to watch us the whole time of our two hour protest, yet that not one of them had any time to go in and tell the gun dealer, you can't do what you're doing, it's illegal. And the breaking them apart like they did, the attorney general of the state said, that's illegal. So, I mean, that's what that was what gave me the idea that made me strong on it and also take the enforcement out of the hands of the sheriffs who don't agree with the law anyways. And in fact, there was a gun, sh a gun shooting competition in uh, Palisade where the sheriff sent out a letter to people who might participate saying, I'm not gonna enforce this law. You know, you don't need to worry, you don't need to worry. So, uh, so that's one thing we can also put it in to make uh, safety and security stuff so to stop smashing grabs, that they have to lock up the guns at night in a safe or in some other means uh, and have security cameras and all sorts of other things we could do to, um, to make the places more safe and not a menace to their communities. The smashing grabs aren't as big a problem as they were like four years ago, but they're, they're still a problem. There's still a problem with stolen guns from stores and also do accounting on them to try to narrow down who are gun dealers who are maybe feeding guns into the illegal market and doing straw purchases and have paperwork verified and checked. You know, ATF can't get around to many gun stores to inspect them, but if we put it in Colorado, we can we can uh, more carefully enforce those and have it done regularly and make them be following the law and be more careful. I, I'm, there are many gun dealers, I'm sure, that are very upstanding and great, but it's there are it, it only takes a few. And, and here we have the Centennial Gun Club, which is a very upscale mm -hmm. place, flagrantly violating the law because nobody's doing anything to stop them. Mm -hmm. Anyways, any other questions? Leslie. Um, as you were answering the other questions, I've come up with like 50 more questions to ask, but I will limit it. Uh, I will limit it. Um, I actually am in Broomfield and I'm the local group leader for Moms Demand Action um, here in Broomfield. And um, I was just attending a study session last night or Broomfield study session on um, basically the regional ordinances that have been happening in Boulder, um, Superior, Lafayette and Louisville. And I didn't know, Eileen, if you and Ceasefire were involved in any of those conversations with 
um, with any of the municipalities in regards to overturning or once preemption was overturned, have you, you guys have a lot of great ideas. And one of the things that um, one of the council members last night had brought up is we, they want to extend the waiting period, but then also have a um, somehow incorporate some education or training as you're waiting to be able to purchase oh, your gun and as your background's coming back. And I haven't, um, anyways, I just hadn't really heard of that. And it almost seems like, well, duh, yeah, we should be, I mean, again, unless it's like a concealed carry um, permit, that's not necessarily, you could just go in and if you pass your background check in 45 minutes, you get your gun and off you go. So has ceasefire looked at putting that education piece on the table? Not for local ordinances. And okay. that would be uh, quite a, it would be interesting to do, but it hasn't been done with local ordinances. That would be all wrapped up in the gun owner licensing, which I said is sort of the holy grail of gun violence prevention. Um, you might, uh, probably half the people on this call already know this, that in Connecticut, they implemented a gun dealer a permit to, not gun dealer, gun owner permit to purchase program. And they saw gun homicides go down 40% in, and they didn't see other things go the same way at that time. And then in Missouri, they got rid of their permit to purchase program and they saw gun homicides go up 25%. And, and so it's just very, very strongly demonstrating the power of um, permit to purchase where almost every program has that has the permit to purchase incorporates training, but you have to have training in order to buy a firearm, which you don't have to have in Colorado. All you have to do is pass a background check and it can be, I don't know what the current wait time is, but it could be, 20 minutes, half an hour. It got really long when there was the surge in gun buying during the pandemic. Things got into several days, but that's changed. I will point out when we saw that surge in gun buying in 2020, I knew the gun deaths were going to go up. And, they, and they've gone up quite significantly, like 45% or something since, since uh, 2019. In the homicides, I believe it's uh, we just knew it was going to happen. The more guns out there, the more gun deaths. It's a pretty strong equation: more guns, more gun deaths. Yeah, it's sad that that correlation isn't evident to everyone, <laughs> as we heard a lot of testimony last night. But um, that's yeah. People, so, anyways, people, thank you for all you do. I appreciate thank it. You're welcome. People often buy guns to protect their families, but instead, and, and, and I'm sorry if there's somebody here who disagrees with me because I know many people own guns to protect their families and their homes, but it's, it's statistically proven. It's been shown that when you bring a gun home, you actually are endangering your family. But be it for suicide, accidents, um, very rarely used, to, it doesn't happen that often that it's the gun is used to shoot someone in the home who's a menace to the family. And well, we in do. fact, oh, I was going to say this, I look at the gun violence archive all the time. There are very, very few home invasions listed where they list fatalities and, and um, injuries from guns. And if you go down and say, okay, give me all the um, home invasions that happened. And I think there were maybe six last year and, uh, and there may be five the year before home invasions or burglaries where there were shootings. So, I mean, that's not to make light of, I know mm -hmm. the case only a mile from my house where someone was shot and killed in a home invasion. So I'm not making light of that. It's just that they're very small compared to the 274 homicides we had last year in this state, gun homicide. Okay. Uh, Maud is wondering if you have Colorado ceasefire members in Centennial or unincorporated Arapahoe County who could lean on Sheriff Brown 
Um, okay. I can say that the league does have members in those areas, uh, but go on. Eileen. Yeah, we do, and we probably should lean on him more. I mean, there was effort made, and I think we just have been put our put our um, efforts into other things, but that's a, a good point. We do have people in Centennial and Arapahoe County. We have a lot of members, and so does Moms Demand Action, so, and other groups, CFCU, um, that we could maybe make a big stink about that. It's, it's really rather disappointing that he did it. The response, when Tom Mauser, who is on our board, and he lost his son at Columbine when he called the sheriff's office about it, they just said we did they didn't have the time to, to devote to that, to pursue pr prosecuting. You know, and really all they needed to do was go tell them, you can't do this. If you, don't, if you continue to do this, we're gonna arrest you. Because it is illegal. And it's a misdemeanor offense for them to be selling those. But that'd be good also to maybe work with the League of Women Voters and the other gun groups and the CCAGV to 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 kind of tell them we're not happy about this. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, collective voices are louder. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Thank you very much for uh, this information tonight. Uh, 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 we appreciate your time and your motivation uh, towards this important topic. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon and uh, even more importantly, partnering again soon. Maude, did you want to say something? Um, two things. If, uh, Eileen, if you do want to get something together with uh, um, to uh, a group together to go talk with uh, Sheriff Brown, um, uh, the uh, Arapahoe Douglas, I'm on the Arapahoe Douglas League Board, as well as the okay. State Board, and I live in Centennial, so okay. I'll, I'll drop my contact info into okay. the chat, and then Beth probably wants to read, without the misspelling, the note I typed in the chat. Um, <laughs> The League of Women Voters, our, our annual Making Democracy Work Day, ironically, is at night this year, uh, this Friday evening, and uh, included on the agenda uh, is Mr. McMillan, who is the Executive Director of the Colorado Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Oh, great. So uh, registration is still open for that event on the League's website. It is via Zoom. Uh, so accessible to all. Again, thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Eileen. Uh, we look forward to uh, continuing this partnership and um, wish you all a safe and uh, productive evening. Thank you. Thank you.